Okay, you're going to want to bring sun cream, a sun hat, and some light breathable clothes. And maybe one of those little battery powered fans, just in case, you know, global temperatures skyrocket by 8 degrees C. Welcome to the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory. Welcome to the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory, the podcast that provides top travel tips for time travellers. I'm your tour guide, David Mountain. For this episode, we're travelling back to the Paleogene. Lasting from 66 to 23 million years ago, the Paleogene is the first subdivision of the Cenozoic Era, a time perhaps better known as the Age of Mammals. Because it's the Paleogene when mammals suddenly radiate from the small, secretive, scrambling animals of the Mesozoic into the remarkably diverse group of animals we know today. But don't get too comfortable. The Paleogene is still full of nasty surprises, from massive hooved predators, to plains of molten rock, to a dangerously volatile climate. So. To help me explore the Paleogene world, I have asked two experts to give me some travel tips. Dr. Sergi Lopez-Torres, a paleontologist at the University of Warsaw. Hello. And Dr. Monica Carvalho, a paleobotanist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Hi, David. Thanks for having me back. This is very exciting. It's exciting to have you back. So, Monica, the last time you were on this show, you were guiding me through the Cretaceous the period that preceded the Paleogene. And it was quite hot, it was quite wet, there were a lot of jungles, and there was no ice at the poles. So how similar is the climate of the Paleogene? Has it changed much since the Cretaceous? Well, now that we're stepping, you know, going into more recent times, so between the Cretaceous and the Paleogene, we had this huge mass extinction caused by a giant asteroid that hit the Earth. And right after the asteroid hit the Earth, the climate became a little bit strange. All this debris, product of the asteroid's impact, probably caused some really short global cooling that may have lasted a few hundred years. But then after that, the climate became quite similar to what we had been seeing in the late Cretaceous. So we still have a world that's pretty warm, pretty humid, full of jungles, and there are still no ice caps on the poles. Now, as you mentioned, despite the similarities here, the Cretaceous and the Paleogene periods are separated by a quite literally cosmic event, the asteroid impact that wiped out something like three quarters of animal life on Earth, including ammonites, dinosaurs, marine reptiles, and many, many other species. But what I'm interested to learn is how this extinction affected plants. So how did plants and plant communities respond to this extinction event? That's a great question. We usually think about, you know, the end Cretaceous extinction as being extremely harsh for animals mostly. And we generally think that it wasn't too harsh for plants, but that's definitely not the case. The extinction was really, really severe on a lot of plant communities all over the world. And the most noticeable difference is in the abundance of flowering plants. So before the impact, flowering plants were already quite diverse and they were quite abundant, but it's really after the asteroid's impact and after the extinction that Flowering plants just literally took over the world, especially in tropical environments. Do we know why flowering plants really made the most of this opportunity? Did they just happen to recolonize the grounds before the conifers and ferns? Or do they have maybe some advantages over those plants that dominated the Cretaceous that gave them an upper hand here in the Paleogene? 
We don't know for sure, but there are many, many intrinsic things related to flowering plants that may have benefited them and kind of allowed them to colonize a lot faster and to outgrow both ferns and conifers. It probably has to do with the fact that they have overall faster photosynthetic rates, meaning that they can grow a lot faster. That's one of the ideas. Another idea that has been going on for a really long time has to do with the seed structures that flowering plants have in relation to conifers, for example. And it's that flowering plants have these two different layers in their seed coat, and that may have given them an advantage to become to be inherently more resistant to, you know, all these wildfires that were happening and months of darkness that happened right after the asteroid hit. So I'm planning to go on a bit of a trek through these paleogene jungles, nothing too strenuous, and I'm wondering if there are any flowering plant species that I might recognize from the present day, from here in the Holocene. That's quite interesting because actually a lot of the main plant families that we see today they actually started diversifying and really started taking over right during the Paleogene. So we will probably see, and you'll probably see, a lot of plants that you find today. Not the same species, but definitely some things that you can clearly recognize. Among one of those, and especially in the tropics, I know I'm based in the tropics, so that's what I'm most familiar with, are legumes. So legumes are the family of beans. Uh, you have lentils there. You have a lot of these, you know, staple crops, a lot of these nitrogen fixing plants that we rely on for food. So these plants became really abundant and they really took over the tropics right after the impact. You can find them as, you know, giant trees, with huge leaves, huge legume pods. That's the one that's most iconic that you will be able to recognize during the Paleogene. So the age of beans. It's yes, it's the wow. as I like to call it. It is it is the age of beans. Uh, <laughs> so the Paleogenes begin to sound like one of these big transitions in the story of life, at least from a human perspective. It's when forests and plant communities become much more recognizable from the Mesozoic when. There's still plants and groups of plants that you recognize, but the assemblages seem a bit off to our eyes. But here in the Paleogene, it's becoming a bit more familiar. That's right. We start seeing rainforests as we know them today. So, you know, these jungle-like, really dense, different strata, plants growing on top of plants. That structure and those levels of productivity that we see today in the Amazon rainforest, for example, that's what we start seeing in the Paleogene. And what's really surprising is that because the global climate was a lot warmer, we can see these similar type of assemblages, these rainforests in much higher latitudes that we see them today. So going up into you know, 40 degrees north, 40 degrees south, we see communities that are not strictly composed by the same plant families that we see today, but they do have that very similar resemblance in how rainforests look. It's a really good point because I think something that surprises a lot of backpackers who head to the Paleogene is just how extensive these tropical and subtropical environments are. Definitely. It's a very, very different world, but as I like to think about it, it's the perfect world to be a backpacker. Because, you know, you can literally just kind of hike all around the world and not worry too much about the weather. As you mentioned, one of the most outstanding things is that we see that tropical-like rainforests would extend far beyond the tropics. We would have palms and tropical-like vegetation going up, you know, as far up as Northern Europe. And actually, over the Arctic Circle, we also find dense plant communities. And it's really, really crazy to think that, you know, you can be hiking in the middle of the winter or close to, you know, the beginning of winter in order to have some light. And it's a perfect camping spot. You have trees that are deciduous, a very mild winter, so it's just absolutely perfect to go and see, you know, the northern lights. You know, it sounds really nice, 
because a lot of these destinations that I've been visiting have really been quite tough. You need to have a certain survival instinct. But the paleogene, I mean, yeah, it's a bit hot, it's a bit muggy, that's fine. But other than that, it actually sounds like quite a fun place to visit. Yes, it is. The only moment in which I would definitely not recommend going is right in the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum in the tropics. I would not recommend that at all because that's a point in history in which global climate gets really, really warm. And the tropics, being warm as they are, would have experienced seawater temperatures of up to 32 degrees Celsius. And I don't know about you, but I don't really like to get in, you know, in the ocean at 32 degrees Celsius. Yeah, if you can't even cool down in the ocean, then you're probably stuck. So let's talk a bit more about this. It's at the border of the Paleocene and Eocene, which are the first two subdivisions of the Paleogene. And it looks like, when you look at temperature charts, like a really sudden, severe spike in temperatures. How fast was it in kind of real world terms? So this is the closest analog to, you know, the rising temperatures that we're seeing today. But even though it's the closest analog, it was actually a lot slower than what we're seeing today. It took nearly 200,000 years for temperatures to spike up an average of between 5 to 8 degrees Celsius and then come back down again. So that's, you know, in geological terms, that's really, really fast. In human terms, it's not that fast. And actually, the rate at which climate is changing right now is a lot faster. Do we know what caused this thermal maximum, this big spike in temperature about a third of the way through the Paleogene? So what's really interesting about this spike in global temperature is that it was also associated to greenhouse gases. So especially CO2 and methane. And now what we're thinking, this is still an area of active research, but what we're seeing is that it has to do with the opening of the North Atlantic Igneous province. So you can see today in Iceland, Iceland has this volcanic plume that's actually forcing and kind of separating the North Atlantic plate. And we believe that this actually started in relation to the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. So with all that volcanism that actually formed the North Atlantic Igneous province, that it's something that we can see today in the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland and Fingal's Cave in Scotland. Those rocks were associated to this massive volcanism that started right around that time. With that volcanism, what happened is actually, you know, a lot of organic material that was in the seafloor just started almost like burning and bubbling up as CO2. These gases caused a severe spike or a severe increase in CO2 levels and methane levels in the atmosphere, and that in consequence increased global temperatures. Right, okay. So for this span of 200,000 years, it's going to be really hot, really muggy, sticky, sweaty, and all of those unpleasant things. Exactly. Exactly. That was another key thing, is that it wasn't just hot, it was very humid as well. Well, like you said, I am going to avoid that because I do not fare well in humid conditions. <laughs> so whenabouts was this? Like, How many million years ago was this thermal maximum? This was 56 million years ago. 56. Okay, yes. I'm going to make a note of that. <laughs> When you're walking through these Paleogene forests, it can be easy to lose your bearings. Not only do they stretch unbroken for thousands of miles, but they're much denser than the Cretaceous conifer jungles that preceded them. Fortunately, a Paleogene map is fairly easy to make sense of. Following the breakup of the supercontinent Pangaea in the Mesozoic, the continents are assuming their modern positions. As a result, the map of the Paleogene before me is, maybe for the first time in our planet's history, recognisably Earth. There are a few differences you'll notice, however. 
South America, where I am currently, is an island, and will remain so for tens of millions of years to come. Across the Atlantic, Europe is a collection of subtropical islands rather than a single landmass. What we would today call the Mediterranean Sea is still the Tethys Ocean, a much larger body of water connecting the Atlantic Ocean to the Arabian Sea. A branch of the Tethys, the Trans-Saharan Seaway, has also spread over much of North Africa, meaning that the desolate Sahara Desert is, in the Paleogene, a dazzling tropical sea. Further east, India's pleasure cruise across the Tethys is about to end in an almighty collision with Asia. The two landmasses haven't yet collided, but already the ancestral Himalayas are rising up out of the sea in between them, as a series of very mountainous islands. One other thing to mention, in case you are planning to visit the British Isles on your holiday, Scotland and Northern Ireland are currently on fire. This is the North Atlantic Igneous province that Monica was referring to, and it's hard to overstate the amount of volcanic activity that was happening there in the Paleogene. There are enormous basalt plateaus up to 1.5 kilometers thick, which were pouring out from this part of the world during this period. So probably one destination to steer clear of. So getting around the world can be a little tricky in the Paleogene. Often you'll find your progress impeded by an unexpected sea or, just occasionally, a hellscape of molten rock. On the plus side, you don't really need to travel that much, because almost wherever you choose to visit, so long as it's not Scotland, you're likely to find yourself in stunning tropical or subtropical landscapes full of really exciting animal life. And it's the animals that I want to find out more about now. Sergi, the Paleogene is the time when mammals begin their extraordinary radiation, this explosion of diversity following the end Cretaceous mass extinction. To put this in context, let's jump back in time just a few million years to the end Cretaceous, just before the mass extinction. What types of mammals were around at this time? What ecological niches did they fill? So just before the Paleogene, you would have things like basal metatherians, which would be the animals that are more closely related to present-day marsupials than they are to placentals. And in there, you would have a little bit of everything. You would have some fairly large mammals, carnivorous mammals, and by fairly large at that time is around five kilograms. Some smaller ones that are more opossum-like. And then you would have also basal eutherians. So those would be the ones more closely related to present-day placentals, and they are the marsupials. And here you have, for example, zalandolestids, which were small insectivores. They were also saltatorial, so they had this locomotor behavior like modern-day bunnies. And then you have other weird things like multituberculates, which were rodent-like mammals, and they had really enlarged teeth that are super bumpy. And then, just to give some representation to the southern hemisphere as well, there are the Gondwana theers. Those would be somewhat bigger, nine kilograms or so. They would be some sort of like groundhog-like mammals. Okay, so there is a fair amount of diversity before the Paleogene. Mm -hmm. But then, obviously, the asteroid hits, we have loads of ecological niches opening up. How soon is it after the Cretaceous that we begin to see mammals adapting to new niches and really radiating? So actually quite early. For example, pantodons are a good example of fairly large herbivorous mammals. They were hippo-like and they appear pretty early after the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction in the early Paleocene. You also have condylarths, which are primitive ungulates, but you also get carnivores. For example, viva rabbits are a group of mammals that are considered to be the earliest carnivorans, and the present-day carnivorans would be dogs, cats, bears, all these sort of animals. And uh, viva rabbits are known to have some specialized teeth of carnivorans called the carnassials, and those teeth are perfect for cutting up meat. Okay, so it's really only a few million years before there's clear evidence that these mammals are, the herbivores are getting bigger, the carnivores are getting more specialized teeth. It is, yeah. So if we, say, jump into the middle Paleogene, about 15, mm -hmm. 20 million years after the Cretaceous, 
could you give an impression of the the diversity of mammals that I might find on my holiday at that point in time? Right. So by the middle Paleogene, then you get a lot of the modern lineages in place already. We can see bats. We can see some tiny horses, for example, that they have three or four toes. So they're a little bit different from the horses today. We also have whales. But the fun thing about whales is that by the early Eocene, they are still land whales. So they have four legs. They are the size of a wolf. Of course, they are not that massive. And they're possibly semi-aquatic. What else? We have primates, we have rodents, we have bunnies. But we also see other types of mammals that don't have modern representatives, like anthracotheres, which were also a hippo-like kind of animal, or other large carnivores like creodons and mesoconids. You mentioned Masonic kids, creodons, these larger carnivores, and we've had pantodonts and thracotheres, these larger herbivores. And I'm glad you mentioned that because there's a common misconception amongst backpackers that you can skip the paleogene. It's not worth visiting because it's just full of small little animals. No, no. And no, I want to dispel that myth. I mean, there's nothing quite as gargantuan as the dinosaurs, fair, but there's still some very impressive animals to look out for on your holiday. Animals such as the brontotheres. So could you tell me a bit about these animals? I mean, what were they? What are they related to? And just how big could they get? So brontotheres are massive rhino-like herbivorous mammals. And although they superficially look like rhinos because they have this very robust built and they have a couple of horns on their nose, but even though they look like rhinos, their relationships are not clear. They are certainly perisodactyls, which is the group that includes rhinos, modern-day rhinos, horses, and tapirs. But their relationships are not certain. They actually vary a lot in size. The earliest brontotheres, those are small and they don't get taller than half a meter. But the largest brontotheres, like megacerops, can stand 2.5 meters tall, 5 meters of length, and weigh over 3 tons. So we're talking about a seriously massive animal. That's enormous. Yeah. A real tank of an animal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, don't go, don't go close to those, no. Yeah. Like you were saying, it wasn't just herbivores that were getting pretty big in the Paleogene. We also have some hefty predators as well. And one of the heftiest is Andrusarchus, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, to me, it kind of looks like a cross between a wolf and a pig that's then been fed a lot of steroids. I mean, this thing is <laughs> almost as big as my car. It weighs over half a ton. It's massive. Uh -huh. I'm not sure what on earth this animal is. It's like nothing on earth today. So could you tell me a bit about Andrew Sarkis, what it is, what it's related to, and maybe how it lived? In my mind, I always had Andrew Sarkis as a very angry big pig, right? It's a pig-like animal. It stood as tall as about a human, over three meters long, but it was also a carnivore. So that would make it the largest meat-eating land mammal of all time. But the most recent analysis suggests that Andrusarchus would be a ceratiodactyl. So that is the group that includes the two-hoofed mammals like sheep, pigs, cows, giraffes, antelopes but also hippos, dolphins, and whales. And despite this pig-like appearance of Andrew Sarkis, this animal appears to be more closely related to hippos and whales than it is to pigs. Something else to look out for when you're trekking through the Paleogene are the mammals that have taken to the trees. A few times now I've seen or heard some furry creatures scrambling in the branches above me or chattering in the trees overhead. Now, are these monkeys? So you have a few primate lineages in the Paleocene and the Eocene. You have basically three main lineages. One is the Plesidapiforms, which are very primitive. They're the most primitive lineages of primates, and they evolved much earlier than monkeys. You'll notice that they lack many of the typical characteristics of modern-day primates like forward-facing eyes, and they have these very large incisors in their mouths, which give them this 
rodent-like appearance. And then there are a couple of other major primate groups in the Paleogene. Those are the adipoids and omomyoids. And the adipoids would be considered the, the ones that have an ecology more like uh, lemurs and omomyoids like modern-day tarsiers. But if you want to see monkeys, uh, you can go to the late Eocene or the Oligocene of South America, and then you'll find the, the very first Pan American monkeys. And if you go to the Oligocene of Tanzania, then you will see the very first Afro Eurasian monkeys. Today, primates are known for their intelligence and their curiosity. Was this the case with these early primates? I'm, I'm just thinking about practicalities here. I mean, are they going to be messing around with my equipment or stealing my food or things like that? Yeah, well, okay, I'll start saying that I love Pleistocene forms. They are my group of study, but, you know, their butt was coming. Uh, they are not the smartest cooking the pot. They had much smaller brains than modern day primates. So I think your equipment will be safe. That's good. <laughs> uh, yes, probably they won't be interested on it. Maybe if you have some berries or something in your pocket, you can lure them in. But they are prey animals, so they will probably be scared of you. And after all, we are fairly large, terrifying primates from the Anthropocene, right? So I don't yeah. think that we are very welcoming to little Pleasant Apiforms. Monica, we've talked about the spike in global temperatures that happened between the Paleocene and the Eocene. Now, after that period of warming, the Earth cools down again and resumes its tropical, but not extremely hot conditions. Conditions that it's had for a long, long time now. And this continues until the late Paleogene, when we start to see another shift in climate, a longer term one now. Our planet starts to get cooler and drier. Now, do we know what caused this shift? So we don't know exactly what caused the shift, but there are several ideas related to this. So one of these ideas has to be with CO2 levels actually dropping down from what we had experienced, you know, during that thermal maximum and a little bit afterwards. And it's believed that a lot of this CO2 actually became buried in oceanic sediments. So a lot of plankton and even freshwater plants may have taken up all this CO2, turned it into organic matter, and then just buried them in the sediments. That is one possibility. And that's something that you know, we have seen previously in the fossil record. In other instances, life also affects biogeochemistry and in turn affects global climate. Another thing that may have been related to this has to do with continental separation between Antarctica, Australia, and South America. So during the Paleogene, you had actually a very nice corridor connecting Australia, Antarctica, and the southernmost part of South America, which was actually really nice. You could have hiked you know, across all these continents. But then as we go towards the end of the Paleogene, these continents end up separating and they leave Antarctica almost like a huge island in the South Pole. With this, there's a creation of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which is one of the strongest currents that we see in Earth today. This marine current, what's actually doing is that it actually kind of avoids or limits the amount of warm water that can travel down to the southern poles. And this may have affected, you know, the whole circulation pattern of warm waters and may have contributed to ice that started forming in Antarctica and the general global cooling trend that we see at the end of the Paleogene. Okay, so you've got this massive cold current of water kind of blocking Antarctica off from the rest of the warmer world allowing Antarctica to get colder, get icier. Yes, exactly. As Antarctica is getting colder, the snow starts accumulating. Albedo, which is, you know, that white reflection that snow provides, kind of bounces a lot of radi solar radiation back into space. And that kind of triggers a further cooling of the Earth. 
So what does this cooling mean for all the tropical and subtropical plant communities that we've been talking about? How do they adapt or fail to adapt at the end of the Paleogene to this colder, drier Earth? Oh, it was a massive change because plants, you know, especially tropical plants, they don't like cold and they don't like frost and they don't like dry weather. So during this time, we see that those tropical-like rainforests start receding back into just the tropical belt where climate was a lot better for them. And we start seeing that different plant communities start to appear. So during kind of that really warm period of the Paleogene, we see that in Antarctica, in the Southern Hemisphere, there are rainforest-like assemblages along the coasts, but then these start disappearing and they start being replaced by conifers. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's mostly monkey puzzle trees. And in the Northern Hemisphere, it's mostly pine trees, cypress trees, metasequoias and others that start taking over. So again, it's becoming a little bit more familiar to the world we're used to today. Exactly. It's becoming a lot more familiar. So you start seeing a lot of these, you know, deciduous forests that you can find in northern United States or in Europe, and a lot of these, you know, boreal-like assemblages that you see in really, really high latitudes in Scandinavia in the northern part of Canada. And Sergi, how do mammals fare at this point in Earth's history? Which animals do well and which struggle as our planet begins this cooling phase? So the shift that you see in the mammalian fauna is the loss of archaic groups of mammals typical of the Paleocene and Eocene that were adapted to forest browsing and the arboreal lifestyle. So the winners of this extinction event would be, for one, large mammals adapted to browsing coarser plant material, so horses, there are also oreodons, which were another pig-like type of animal, camels, uh, rhinos, true rhinos in this case, and small mammals adapted to grain eating. So you have crescetids, which are hamsters. You have gophers as well, uh, doing well, squirrels, rabbits. And then in terms of the losers, so the tree-dwelling animals were seriously affected by this. So this is what drove to extinction primates in North America and Europe. They survived in other areas, but that was tough on them. And then rodent-like marsupials in South America also did not do well. But we also lose the brontotheres that we were just talking about, very charismatic animals, but they didn't make it past the late Eocene. That's all we have time for today. But before we go, I'd like to ask each of my guests for their one must-see Paleogene experience. I would definitely recommend going camping, not in the north, but in the south. I would definitely recommend, you know, going around the coast of Antarctica and early, early southern winter to catch the boreal lights. And, you know, those rainforests were absolutely magical because it's something that doesn't really exist today. They don't have an analog. The plants that live there can imagine, you know, kind of a mixture of some monkey puzzle trees, a lot of tree ferns mixed with palms. And this is the time where flowering plants are taking over, they're diversifying. So you'll be able to find such an outstanding different types of fruits, different types of flowers. And well, with that, you know, all these marsupials that are now extinct, but they were probably doing a lot of what monkeys are doing today. So I would definitely recommend going to Antarctica during the Paleogene. And how about you, Sergi? So I would recommend doing some trekking around the Arctic during the early Eocene, preferably during the summer, when the temperature is around 20 degrees, so it's very comfortable. And it's your chance to see a very uh, different landscape from today. With a rainforest environment, you have hippo-like pentadons, tapirs, alligators, turtles, and even small primates, 
and carnivores on the forest canopy. So it's, a, it's shockingly different. And But I would caution against going through the dark season because that's the Arctic, right? And that would be rather terrifying to go into a rainforest during the dark season. But if that's what the backpacker is into, then by all means, go ahead. <laughs> and all that's left for me to say is thank you very much to my two guests, Dr. Monica Carvalho and Dr. Sergi Lopez Torres for sharing their paleogene travel tips. If you've enjoyed what we've been talking about today, then make sure to check out their research. There are links in the episode notes. And most of all, thank you to you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And if you have, please feel free to like, share, subscribe, and leave a positive review. And I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory. But until then, safe travels. Mm-hmm.